This is Talks, where people speak to people about crafting brands and the power of storytelling. I'd like to start off by a bit of a trip in nostalgia mode. Obviously, you've been in this business for a very, very long time. So you're in over 12 countries, more than 60 restaurants, and now including Malt as well. <laughs> Can I take you back to the very first brand that you created? What was the thought process behind it? And what led you to create this brand? Right. You know, you know my first restaurant I opened in, in New York City about 30 years ago. And obviously at that, at that point in time, I, I was not thinking about a brand, right? I was just thinking about surviving in the restaurant business in New York City, you know, the toughest market in the world. Um, and my first restaurant that was called Savannah, it was like a French American bistro. Um, but that was my stepping stone to doing Maya, which was my Mexican restaurant. But I, I wanted to learn about New York City first with a smaller, you know, smaller restaurant because New York is very competitive, you know, probably the most competitive in the world. So I needed to understand how people perceived, you know, Mexican food. I wanted to understand, you know, who my target market was going to be. So in order to develop a brand, I had to understand the dynamics of what I was creating, right? Um, and so fast forward. I think it was three years after I did Savan, I did Maya, okay. you know, which got you know, two stars by the New York Times. Um, and it was kind of my first dive into you know, Mexican food in, in the U.S. Again, 30 years ago, Mexican food in New York City and in the United States was seen as a very fast, casual, very inexpensive food. So I had a big, big challenge ahead of me to, to convince people and help people understand that Mexican food could be brought to another level. Elevation. Right? And, you know, all the cuisines had done, and, you know, Italian went from pizza and pastas to, you know, Mediterranean Italian restaurants, you know, French went from, you know, Nouvelle to, to, to you know, to more modern, to more contemporary, where the French started to open up and using other ingredients, um, you know, but when people don't know anything about something, you know, it's, it's easy to introduce them to something new, mm. but to go into a market with Mexican food, which was Venice, seen as very low, very heavy, very street foodish, very casual, you know, it was a challenge, um, but, you know, Maya was, you know, very successful and kind of that was my, again, my stepping stone into what was going to come in the future. You talk a lot about the markets and right. penetrating the market. Correct. How important is it when you choose your countries, when you choose where to passport your brands almost, to understand the market and to understand the appetite of that market towards your brand? Yeah, I mean, it's, again, it's, it's super important to, you know, to understand the market, right? Uh, because, again, Mexican food is, when I was doing Mexican, you know, New Yorkers perceive Mexican very different than L.A. You know, and Denver side very different than New York. So, you know, you have, to, you have to really understand, you know, in order to succeed, you know, what their expectation is and then, and then you know, fulfill that expectation. Um, and fortunately or unfortunately, you know, with Maya, you know, when people wanted Maya, I went into Denver and I said, well, Maya doesn't fit here mm -hmm. because Maya's different. Uh, and I, I cannot just completely tweak it to a different market. But let me do something similar to Maya that fits, you know, the Denver rights, the people that in Denver will, will, will understand. And I came up with Tamayo. So for me, it was very important, you know, when I went into different markets, you know, understand, you know, what people's expectation was, you know, to be able to create a brand that, you know, met the market needs. I think it fits into the narrative that we're bringing to the table as well. You know, this crafting brands for people. Right. I am one of those that believe that brands are the ones that sit in the middle, but right. people work with people and we people work for people. Correct. And when we talk about people, you also talk a lot about people branding. We were, we were sharing some, some, our mutual love for sneakers, our, our, our thoughts about the tennis world, so and so right. forth. Uh, how, what, what importance do you give to people branding, to your personal branding, because ultimately you are the face of these global brands? Right. And I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a great question. And, I, and for me, it was very important you know, to brand the Richard Sandoval brand and then kind of have everything else trickle under that. Because I think if I would have done just Maya copy-paste, I may, may have had a global brand. But for me, you know, copy paste, it almost dilutes sometimes, you know, a brand. So for me, I said, you know, let me create the Richard Sandoval brand and then have sub brands that trickle into that. And that's how, you know, you know we have Maya, we have Toro Toro, we have Toro, we have Noyane, we have Zengo. Um, but people's expectation for a Richard Sandoval restaurant 
is you know the Richard Sandoval brand. There's very there's a lot of similarities. Or there's flavor profiles, mm -hmm. and so people follow that. And so when they see a Richard Sandoval restaurant, you know they have a certain expectation that you know Richard Sandoval you know has under his brand. I can actually vouch for that, if I may, from our personal experiences working with your team. Right. I remember when I received your branding guidelines, I could see that there is the umbrella brand vision. Correct. That it is then cascaded down to a number of applications, whether it's in the kitchen world, whether it is in the service world, whether it is in the branding world. And I think something that is very, very important as well is the element of personalization, which I think you give a lot of importance to. Are you personally involved? in the development of brands, in the, in the conceptualization of brands? Do you get involved in the micromanagement, if you want to call it, of brand design? You couldn't have described me in a better way than saying I'm a micromanager, <laughs> <laughs> which is not necessarily great, though, because then, you know, when you have 60 restaurants in 12 countries, four continents. It's a lot of work. A lot of work when you're, when you're micromanaging. But for me, it was, it's, it's been always very important to control, you know, my narrative, you know, because it's my name. It's, at the end of the day, that's all I have. So if I don't take care of that, you know, or I didn't take care of that, I don't think we, we'd be where we are today. Um, but, um, you know, I think, you know, restaurants are lifestyles, right, today more than ever because people with globalization and, you know, social media have access to things very fast. So people's expectations are much higher. Absolutely. Because before, you know, let's say you were just in Malta, you knew what was happening in Malta. But today, you know, you see what's happening in New York, you're seeing what's in Dubai and, you know, these, you know, really relevant you know, cities, um, and you want that, you know, so your expectation, if you see Toro Toro in Dubai, you know, you expect something similar, you Absolutely. know, if you go to Toro Toro in, uh, in, in Malta. But what I will say is that, you know, within these parameters, you know, I allow in my restaurants and, you know, our brands, you know, a 30% lead way. And what, is, what does that mean is that, you know, for example, when I opened Toro in Tokyo, you know, I was not, you know, the sushi and the, um, you know, sashimi element, I tweaked that, you know, more into a Latin way because I was not going to yeah. go to Tokyo and teach them how to eat sushi, right? I mean, they, they have not. a different expectation. And so every restaurant, there's a 35% that I leave, you know, what I call tropicalizing to the marketplace. And I think, you know, because a lot of times, you know, people, when they haven't seen something or are not, you know, understanding of ingredients or, or, or certain cuisines or cultures, the, they would go into a restaurant, look at the menu, say, I don't get it, and they would probably walk away, right? Yeah. So you have to have certain things that, you know, as a hook, let people go and look at the menu and say, well, I, I understand this, I get this, and then, the, you know, you'll, you'll get them to come into the restaurant. Then it's up to us, you know, as, you know, the owners of the brand and, and, and our team to be able to navigate our guests to, to tasting, you know, more different and unique things. So we always like to say, you know, our waiters, if you don't like something, you know, We'll order it, but we'll change it if you don't like it. And that's the way we get people, you know, to try different things, to challenge their palates, and to walk out of here and say, wow, what an experience. You know, I didn't eat chilies before, but I had them here, now I enjoy them. Yeah. So, I, and that's why I think, you know, again, it, it, it creates brand value, right? And I think what you're referring to, Chef, is the element of, and I can see a lot of parallels between the hospitality industry, the, the catering industry, and the marketing industry. It's the power of localization. You mentioned this 30%, which I think right. is so important. And you also refer to the customer journey. Because ultimately, when someone is dining at any of your restaurants and you are walking him through a journey of food, um, of tastes, of profiling, so on and so forth, they are effectively accompanying your thought process. Correct. What importance do you give to the full element of the sensory approach? So we think of ambiance, we think of color, we think of music, we think of flavors, we think of service, we think of food, we think of beverage. What is the right formula, and is there a right formula for all these to come together? Yeah. You know, as I said earlier, I mean, I think, you know, today, restaurants are lifestyles, right? It's, it's, it, it's a go-to. It's a go-to, and people pick things based on their lifestyle, right? So, so they expect all these things. You know, when I first opened my restaurant 30 years ago, you know, it was all, 80% was about the food, and then you know, the other 20% was, you know, everything else. Today, I mean, I, I like to say, you know, food is probably 50%. Oh. And then, you know, mixology, you know, music. And you said it very clearly. I mean, when you walk into a place, I mean, you have to activate all my senses, right? And, you know, these are all, you know, memories that I will remember when I, when I leave that space. And that's going to want me to come back to that, you know, journey again. 
you know, whether it's the music, whether it's, you know, the music, whether it's the mixology, the smoke, the fire. You know, one thing we, under, we need to understand is that, you know, today we eat with our phones, right? <laughs> Not just with our mouths and it's our brains. So, so you have to create food that's very, you know, Instagrammable. It pops up. It pops up because people, you know, again, going back 30 years ago, we, we, you know, we relied on newspapers, magazines. Today, it's on social media, whether it's a TikTok, whether it's, you know, you know um, Instagram. And people take pictures, and then it, you know whether it goes viral or you know it hits you know you know yeah. fit, you know a hundred of their friends. Well, it's, that's that's what word of mouth is today. Before it was you know you coming out of here telling five or ten people. Today it goes much faster, right? You know, um, so too fast sometimes. It, sometimes too <laughs> fast. And you know, I, and I, you know, if I can touch on this point is point is that before you know, and you said uh, uh, as we sat down, you said, well, you know, I was here when you first opened, and I've seen that evolution of you know how much better it is. So before, when you opened a restaurant, you know, magazines and, and newspapers gave you probably two to three months, you know, to be able to work, you know, the kinks out. Today is a very different marketplace because it's fast, right? An influencer comes in, boom. and boom, you know, it, it hits. You know, if he has I don't know five hundred thousand, I mean, like that. Yeah. So you you have to be you know work much faster. Um, you know, and, 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 and get up to speed, you know, really fast, which I think sometimes is, is not fair because what nobody understands is that, you know, restaurants, it's not like opening, a, you know, a tech, you know, office where you buy computers and, you know, you hire two or three people, you know, you, you, you inject information to the computer. I mean, here you, it's like leading an orchestra, right? You have hostesses, they meet you at the street, they put you in the elevator, then they reach you up here. Then, you know, there's a bartender, there's a bar back, there's, there's drinks with fire, with smoke, with recipes. Ingredients change. They're not, sometimes they're not as sweet because you're in different marketplace. Mm. Then you go into the kitchen and you have, you know, the, the, the cold station, the hot, um, and they have to coordinate so the food comes out at the same time. Then you have the waiters, the, the, the busters, the music curators. So it's really, a, you know, a whole kind of like a movie that, 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 that you it's create. It's a brand SOP. Yes, it, yeah, but it, and it, it's theater. Right, and, it, and it, it just it takes a lot of work, a lot of elements, and that's why, you know, people don't understand. You know, also the failure rate of restaurant is very high, because there's so many elements, and I, and I don't think people understand the difficulty of you know coordinating all this, you know, at one time, one place, um, and, and just have it move you know, in real time. I love what you said about fairness. Obviously, we're coming from the branding world, and sometimes people judge you even from the moment you develop an identity from the moment you launch an identity. Correct. And sometimes with the influential marketing of nowadays, sometimes you don't even have the time to engage in proper storytelling. So I think it's really evident in the restaurant world. I think you put it perfectly there, if I may. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and, and uh, you know, after 30 years, you know, we, we, you know, we've learned and, you know, so, you know, sometimes, you know, we were able to cut the times short, but still, I mean, I think people, you know, in three months, you'll see even a, a great revolution, you know, as, as the cooks are trained and the flavors, you know, as everything comes together. So, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's a great uh, you know, story to tell. Absolutely. Um, Chef, let me just take you back to the parallels between branding and personal branding. And I, I know and I've had the privilege to work with your team since day one in Malta. And I know how passionate your brand is and you yourself are about your social responsibility project. Correct. Called Viva Beas. Correct. Can you please tell us more about this and tell us about the brand value that it gives to you, to your brands, and right. to your team? Right. Well, you know, I've developed in the last couple of years a couple, you know, I have a cohort program also, you know, that where, you know, it's a mentorship program where, you know, we, we you know, have applications. You know, last year we got about 1,500 applicants, mm. whether it's, um, you know, it's influencers, it's, it's chefs, it's... Uh, you know, food curators, um, they want to get into the space. Um, and then I, from those 1,500, I pick five, and then they get to spend a week with me. You know, this year they were in Cabo at the Four Seasons in an opening of a restaurant. And, you know, and as, as you well said, you know, you have ejas. Um, you know, and the reason for doing these things, I think, is as I get older, you know, before I was just driven, you know, you know just loving and doing, doing what I do. It's never been about owning 100 restaurants or, you know, whatever. It's never been about that. It, it's... It's, you know, doing what I love to do. And I've always said, it, as I can continue to do what I love to do, I will continue to do it. When, when I start opening restaurants just to open, that's probably the time I will stop. Okay. But going back to, you know, to the cohort and Viva Vejas, it, I think it, it's, it's a way of me of giving back. You know, I've been very fortunate to be given a great opportunity, you know, to do what I love to do in a large scale. So I think it's my personal responsibility to start giving back. You know, there's a lot of information locked in my brain, and unless I start downloading it, you know, if I'm not here, you know, 
you know, we never know when our last day is here, you know, that way information will stay with me. So part of this is, you know, giving back and, and teaching people the things that, I, that I've learned and downloading all the information. And I think it's, you know, part of my legacy. Viva Abejas is, um, is, you know, something that I saw that, uh, a narrative that I think people were not very aware of, you know, but, you know, during COVID and right after COVID, you know, we started, you know, the, the beehive population started to really, yeah. uh, you know, get depleted and we didn't know why. But what, what we do know is that, you know, three out of every f bites of food that you take is through pollinization. So if we didn't do something about their, you know, their, their habitats, uh, you know, our food chain, you know, could, could be in trouble. So, you know, when, I, when, you know, that happened, you know, I wanted to create awareness. And I've always believed that, you know, if you start with the younger generations, you know, it's, that's the way to make change, right? I mean, you know, I'm older, you know, it's very unlikely that I'm going to change a lot at my age. Um, <laughs> But young kids, you know, they're, 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 they're sponges, they, they, they absorb. And, you know, and I, I take this book and I do book readings to, you know, schools in different places. And I, I'm astounded about how much they absorb, how, how they ask questions, and how their perception, you know, about bees start to change. Because, again, bees, everybody says they, they sting you, so, you know, you need to kill them. You're in the pool, they're buzzing, they're making noise. And so I just wanted to, yeah, again, create awareness and, you know, let kids know that, you know, if they're not around, you know, you know our food, you know, cycles and chains could be in trouble. And, again, but I think the most important thing is to start giving back, uh, you know, some of what I was given to me. I love what you said about responsibility. Right. Because we in the business world sometimes, we're obviously driven by value. We're Correct. driven by shareholder value. We're right. driven by success. We're driven by right. growth. Right. But sometimes responsibility is almost taken, given a second priority. Right. So I think there's actually something that we will take home with us from this interview today. The element of responsibility also from a social community point of view. Correct. It's not only about just driving a PR element. Right. But it's also, you know, your personal value that you bring to the table. And it's very interesting what you said about the root cause identification of the food chain. Right. Because you're attacking it where it really matters. What, what advice? Would, so you, you've, you've, you've built these brands globally in a number of markets, in a number of continents. What advice would you give? You mentioned to me it was never my intention to get here. It happened and you're fortunate and obviously, obviously worked very hard for it. What advice would you give to aspiring chefs, to aspiring entrepreneurs? aspiring brand-driven people to think globally? Right. I mean, I, I, I think I'm a perfect example, uh, you, know, you know, one man, you know, at 23 years old, you know, moves to New York, you know, no money, uh, and had a dream, right? So I think what I would you know, tell people is, I mean, believe that dreams do come true. You know, I think sometimes we think that, you know, it can't happen to me, it's, it's not going to happen, but it will happen. You know, it, it is possible. So, you know, but I think once you set a goal and you set your dream, then, you know, as I like to say, you know, there is no free meal. Right? <laughs> it's, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, you have to be driven. You know, you, you have to have passion. And, you, and make sure that you're doing something that you love to do because you're going to spend half your life, you know, doing, you know, whatever, whatever you're choosing to do. But understand that, you know, especially in this industry, that, it, you know, it, it's hard work. Uh, you know, and I was at a, at a conference with Adrian Ferrar I know, uh, two weeks ago in, in, in Mexico, and he said something, you know, very interesting. He said, you know, I, I worked, you know, I think he said from, you know, five in the morning to, you know, one o'clock in the morning, you know, and, and, and he was kind of telling these younger generations, you know, it's, if you want to be great at what you do, it's going to take a lot of work, and you've got to be willing to put in the work, you know, to be successful. Um, I don't necessarily agree that you have to work, you know, 18 hours a day. I do agree that you, you, know, you have to put in work, you have to work smart, um, you know, not a lot. And I think today, you know, we have a, many more tools that we may not have had before. You know, before, you know, we had to go to the, you know, look at books, you know, today you, you Google something, you get information much faster. Yeah. So, but still, I mean, I think, you know, it resonated with me that, you know, you have to work hard. You, know, you have to be prepared. If you want to be that. successful, you know, you have to work hard, have passion and love what you do. Very good. Chef, from my end, I would really like to thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much for your time. Thank you for having the time to sit with us, share your personal experiences with us, and sharing your knowledge. I appreciate for having, appreciate for having me. Thank, thank you. you, Chef. Yep, thank you.